right, so welcome to our last, this is our last one. We will not have Sunday school next week or January 2nd. And at the end, I'm gonna ask Carl to share what he's going to be teaching in January. So we're very excited. Carl is going to be teaching our Sunday school lesson in the new year. Uh, but this morning, we're gonna look at a couple of different, if you have your book, um, we're gonna look at Christmas Eve, which is the object for Christmas Eve is cloth. And we're gonna look at Christmas Day, which is light. And hopefully, if we have time, just maybe one or two from um, the first week of Christmas, which is hearts. Um, so the reading that comes to us for Christmas Eve is Luke verse 7 from chapter 2. And she gave birth to her firstborn and wrapped him in bands of cloth <clears throat> and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Jill starts out by saying that her Bible dictionary tells her that wrapping an infant in a band of cloth is, quote, a normal act of child care for warmth, security, etc. She writes, I like the etc. <laughs> Said even the person who put together the entry in the reference resource recognizes that swaddling a baby, while practical and soothing, entails an ineffable more. And she recalls when her first child was born, Joseph, was his name Joe? <laughs> his name is Joseph, by the way. Um, I don't think she mentions his name, but um, his name is Joseph. He's no longer a child, he's finished with college. But <laughs> just an aside. Uh, but she said, uh, she, she recalls her time when the nurse came in and showed her how to swaddle her son. And it's, oh, it looks so easy, and then, she tried it and it was just this loose mess of cloth that, you know, and, and he was kicking and flailing about. So the nurse came back in and showed her once more. <laughs> and she writes, I wondered about the wisdom of these competent people at the hospital, allowing me to take him home <laughs> mere hours after his arrival, <laughs> which I thought was very funny. She said, we began to figure out the et cetera of loving someone more than we had previously known we could love another. On Christmas Eve, the fullness, the full humanness of Jesus stuns me no less than I, when I look at my own firstborn. After all this waiting and preparation that cannot really prepare us, he is finally here and oh so beloved. So she reminds us of how we are then ironically wrapped in the cloth of Christ. It says Mary swaddles the baby in whom we will be clothed, all of us enveloped by the unrelenting compassion and grace of our God. Even as we stumble and bumble, learn and fail, no, have to go. <laughs> um, nothing can undo the mantle of love in which we are covered. We see the baby Jesus wrapped by his mother in bands of cloth and know the one she holds has the whole world in his hands. Therefore, we can rest secure. So her, it's not really a question, but just a sort of a charge. It says, whenever you touch cloth today, which will not be hard since we're all clothed, allow it to remind you that you are also clothed in Christ, wrapped in the love of God. So I love this, this passage, it's very, it's only one, uh, one reflection on cloth, but the idea that this infant that, that desires to be comforted himself, Christ, just like any other mortal child born of woman is wanting to be soothed and comforted and, and swaddled. And we have the story of Mary, and she also talks about just imagining Mary fumbling as much as she did, <laughs> trying to figure out, and she said she didn't even have the benefit, you know, of the nurse to help her. But, and they would use strips of cloth and just wrap and wrap until this baby was like a little burrito, little burrito baby. Um, <laughs> all snug, and how Mary, this, this child herself really, so young, um, and so blessed, but still you can only imagine. And I love how Jill says, and she's holding the whole world in her arms. 
how powerful that image is to imagine this tiny little child that you yourself just gave birth to is something so much more, not more. Um, the overabundance of Christ. And, and she, we, we do have the sense that she does know this. She does have that understanding because she ponders this in her heart. We'll hear that, I uh, imagine today, we'll certainly hear it later in the week, that you know, everyone comes to, to look at this child who was born and the shepherds and everyone are flocking to see this child. And she ponders, all she does is ponder silently in her heart that she is holding the hope of the world in her arms. Amazing. No pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure on mom there, right? To raise this child well and keep him healthy and happy. And um, the hope of the world swaddled. So it's a lovely juxtaposition of this little infant who desires the same thing every infant desires, and yet will soon clothe the rest of the world with his love. So I like that idea that as we go about our day or our week, and maybe as you put on a sweater or a jacket or something that you kind of wrap around yourself as well, um, that you'll think of that and remember, uh, it's hard to imagine an infant having so much, so much more in him. And yet there he is, this miraculous being. Um, so it's just, uh, I like this devotional for, for Christmas Eve very much, imagining um, just the humanity of it, but the divinity of it. And that is, of course, the incarnation, um, fully human, fully divine. And Mary and Joseph are, are the ones blessed to behold this in its fullness and to know it in a way that no one else knows. Um, they were there in the first cry of Christ. So what a what a privilege, you know, when you when you read about the Annunciation and you know the angel comes and Gabriel, you know, blessed favored one. And she's probably like, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> but I imagine in the moment of that first cry, she knew exactly what that meant. How truly favored and blessed she was. How hard this was going to be. And she probably did question, just like Jill did, the, the um, wisdom of the divine <laughs> by giving her this child to take into the world where they didn't even have a proper room <laughs> to give birth to this child, right? Um, she probably questioned this, but yet she goes on and they go on. I think poor Joseph, he gets forgotten in the mix, but he's just as important to this story. Um, he is Christ's father. He is the child, the father, the the male in his life who is going to be an exemplar of, of how to be a man in the world. Joseph is extremely important in this story. Um, so don't forget about Joseph either. <laughs> I just like to give him a little extra. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, it's, it's just a, such a simple devotion, but I think it's really powerful. Um, yeah. I can't help oh. but think about Oh, Mary, did you know? <clears throat> yeah. When you think about her holding the child, and just uh, I pulled up the lyrics and just the things that yeah. Mary, did you know that uh, your baby boy would one day walk on water? Yeah. That uh, would save your sons and daughters. Yeah. Uh, that's come to make you new. What did Mary know? Uh, the child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Yes. I mean, isn't that just an amazing thought? Yeah. And Mary, did you know that your baby boy will? Your sight to the blind, calm a storm with his hand, uh, walk with angels trod. Uh, when you kiss your baby, you kiss the face of God. Yeah. Um, maybe did, did Mary, did you know it? He's the Lord of all creation. Yeah. Just think of how, what, she, what, yeah. she, what she could not have known, you know, at that specific right. moment. Uh, the, the, the et cetera. <laughs> yeah. The baby boy will rule the nations, uh, was a heaven's perfect land. And is a great I am. Yeah. yeah, it's a great song that captures that um, what what she knew and what she didn't know. Mm -hmm. She knew holiness in her hands, but what he would mm -hmm. really be doing all that he would do. All that he would do. Mm -hmm. Well if you yeah. think about oh, how sorry, often George. also <laughs> So oh sorry, let me go George and George. then and then well, I think about Carl. clothes the Bible because I got the Israelites clothes didn't wear out when they were walking through the desert. And then we get to heaven, and the 
surprise clothing. I don't remember where. Yeah, this idea of cloth is there. You could do so much more even with cloth. She, she chose it for Christmas Eve and just the singular devotion. But yeah, the cloth that's a that's a great <coughs> image throughout the Bible. But yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't wear out. Where are you going to get cloth in the desert? Nowhere, Carl. <laughs> Well, I think about so many of us don't want to embark on something until we can understand the wholeness, the fullness, that we control the variables, right. that we can control it, right? And yeah. Mary had none of that. <clears throat> Talk about leaping out into the darkness, not knowing, but mm -hmm. in faith. Yeah. And yet she did. Yeah. And thank you for it. Yeah, there, there's no controlling these variables. <laughs> there is no... There is no game plan for her and Joseph. It's like, I'm trusting you with, with the hope of the world. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Figure out. This is your first child. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Everything will be good. Everything will be fine. You know. Luckily, she, she does have her cousin Elizabeth, hopefully, who was a, a guide for her as well. But imagine. The two of them. I can't worry, we are. Be our first child. Yeah. Dropping it. Yeah. <laughs> You're just out of the world. Oh, oh, God. I know. I know. I'm going to drop him. No? You can't imagine. Well, I did I drop mine. <laughs> I like the line that I guess you know, it's used about driving down to the hospital parking lot. <laughs> I know, yes. I mean, you certainly think you should have someone go with you, at least, you know. <laughs> Are we sure we should let them go with this child? You know, yes, they're the parents, but they seem very clueless, right? <laughs> Thinking about how important uh, a baby blanket is to, you know, I, I, one of our sons, Jed, he had a blanket, and he, you know, he was never secure that he had his blanket. Yeah, a piece of cloth, and he wore that sucker down <laughs> until there was a little piece left. I mean, that, it's four inches square, and he would still love that little yeah. piece of blanket. It was so precious to yeah. him. And Hensley did the same thing. Wow. I still have my baby blanket, as a matter of fact. Do you? Is I it, do. Is, is, is it in the pulpit? <coughs> no. Not in the pulpit. No, but I do still have it, and it's actually still one good piece. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I have it. I'm not sure how it survived all this time, but um, but also it just that brought to mind it, you know, the Charlie Brown Christmas special, which is iconic at this point. But at the point where Linus drops his blanket is always, I mean, that's been lifted up many times in, in devotions and sermons. And But it is an important point, too, you know, that this object at some point becomes an object and he can let it go um, because there's something more important to him than that blanket. Um, when he's talking about the story of the birth of Christ. So, yeah, if you watch Charlie Brown, look for that moment when the blanket drops. Think about this devotion. Lots of little connections there. A little, you know, that's one of those little things that's just kind of snuck in there that, you know, until you start really paying attention, like, oh, clever. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> just, again, time management, not my gift. Um, all right, we're going to go to Christmas Day, which is light. Um, not surprising, a passage about light and darkness from John chapter 1, verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. She talks about, you know, this, is, this book just came out, so she is referring to very recent times where everything does seem, seem very overwhelming and dark, and <coughs> she has a list of all of the things that, um, that weigh on us in the world. And then, you know, and I can let you all fill in all of those things because you can think of them. And she said, um, sadly, this could be written on any day in any decade. And I bring that up in, in Bible studies a lot, too, because especially when you have, um, you know, we think everything is about us, <laughs> right? What's your, what's your favorite? I'm not much, but I'm all I think. Exactly. Jane, it's an immortalized <clears throat> phrase. Um, and in every decade, the people of that particular decade. Everything is going to be about them, so whatever is predicted to happen is certainly going to happen to them. But these things have been with us since the, the beginning of time. Um, poverty and hunger and violence and hatred and um, disease, and they've all been with us for so long. But that doesn't change the fact that suffering remains. Right? It is true suffering that continues on. She says, 
sin, evil, and our creaturely limits remain generation after generation. Our need for the light no darkness can overcome does not ever go away. The coming of Emmanuel does not alter our immediate circumstances so much as up in how we navigate and understand them. And I think that's the critical point because yeah, Christmas day, we're not gonna wake up and the world is a, is a happy, harmonious place. Suffering will still be in the world. How do we understand and navigate the suffering of the world? How do we bring that counter narrative of Christ into the world? And so she, she has a little story about um, passing by a billboard that was emblazoned with Jesus is the answer to all, and all is in capital letters, all your problems. And she said this, this kind of annoyed her. <laughs> she said, well, you know, you would think it would, she said, I cannot say it's sentiment engendered warm feelings in me. <laughs> and you would think as a Christian it might, but then she tried to imagine how non-Christians would read it. Um, and she said it just nagged at her she says, the idea that Jesus is simply a means to an end or a magic bullet in the face of life's vicissitudes, it, is, it also felt like a judgment upon my own sorrow regarding the current state of the world and a few personal challenges too. Was I not relying on Jesus enough? Do I not really love my Lord? Do I simply lack faith? So she talks about this and how it just kept nagging at her throughout this drive. Um, and I guess I'm not sure where she was coming from, but over through the night, apparently, she was driving because at some point the sun, well, she's driving into the night, sorry. At some point, the sun begins to set, and it's a beautiful sunset. And then she sees the moon as it comes up, and huge and luminous, she says, its presence unyielding and more obvious as darkness descended. Light present from the beginning that continues to shine and cannot be overcome. Jesus, yes, helps me in my problems, provides hope, strength, and courage for the living of this hour. More than the answer, however, which of course is what the billboard was trying to say, more than the answer, he is Emmanuel, God with us, God for us. The savior of the world who knows our human suffering and refuses to turn away from it, but instead endures it, so that none of what we face is unknown or off limits to God's grace. The one born Christmas Day does not provide us with answers so much as he remains with us and guides us as we wrestle with the most perplexing of life's questions. And I think that's such an important thing for us to remember because we get so, we do, we all get frustrated or despairing when we think, why hasn't God just fixed all this? <laughs> well, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Who did he entrust his creation to? Us. Yeah. He didn't say, oh, just enjoy it and I'll take care of everything. No. No. He said, I'm giving you this incredible, amazing place with all these fantastic creatures and plants and everything you need, you will have. You have everything your body requires to survive and thrive and grow food from the earth and things are just gonna grow on trees and fruits and fishes in the sea. You're gonna have everything you need and you're gonna have company in one another. You're gonna have community. I'm giving you all of these things. Just take care of it. That's not what we always do. Yeah. Just take care of it. It's like God gave us a giant puppy at the beginning. And we were little kids and we said, we'll take care of it. We'll walk it. We'll feed it. We'll be good to it. That poor dog got left out in the rain and missed a few meals. And we're like, where's the dog? Do we have, do we have a dog? I thought we had a dog. We were the most irresponsible of children with this creation that we just went, oh, yeah, we were supposed to. And then we got mad at the dog because it didn't do what we wanted it to do. Yeah, we just, it's just so amazing that we were entrusted with this. And then we get mad at God because it didn't go well. And then we say, Lord, help us. Right, and then we cry out for help. And then we get angry with God because there's suffering in the world. And God's like, I didn't 
do that. I gave you life that could have been perfect. And you made decisions. <laughs> you made decisions on your own that I gave you that gift too. I didn't control you. I didn't tell you. I just gave you some guidelines and said you really should follow these for your own good because I love you. Here's, here are the house rules. <laughs> yep. Don't forget to take care of the dog, right? <laughs> forget, feed the dog. No. And then we're surprised. We're surprised by things that are happening in the world. It's like, oh. God's like, yeah, I'm surprised too. I have higher hopes for you all. But yet he still sends his son to us to be with us to understand our suffering, that God wants to understand what it is that we feel in our suffering, that's incredible. That God wants to know what that feels like to be distant from him. The only way he can do that is to be among us, is to actually understand what that suffering is like. Incredible. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. Any thoughts on that? Any? No, I've got a little more time. So I'm going to do one more. Um, but just thoughts on, on the light. We hear that so often. It's one of those words. It's, it's almost cliche. It's one of the words like, oh, yeah, light of God. It's great. Um, but yeah, we have to stop and think about. You have, to, uh, you have to know you're in darkness before light can dawn. Yeah, you have to recognize it. Read me on something that uh, Otto Chambers mm. in uh, my utmost said this, oh, yeah. <laughs> this morning. And so uh, there must be a sense of need created before the message of Christ is of any use. Yeah. Thousands of people in this world profess to be happy without God. Mm. But if we could be truly happy and moral without Jesus, then why did he come? Right, right. What was the need then? What yeah. was... He came because that kind of happiness and peace is only superficial. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ came to bring, we talk about this, he talked about peace on earth. He, 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 Jesus said, I came to bring a sword. And this is a great line. He said, Jesus Christ came to bring a sword through every kind of peace that is not based on personal relationship with him. Mm -hmm. That's where he. Yeah, like the, his, his the sword is used. Yeah. Manufactured. Yeah. Manufactured peace. Yeah. It's not complete. Right. The things that we have created that serve us. And that's actually, you're always great for a segue, Jerry. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to lead me to the next uh, devotion as well. Um, because, yeah, we create these things. And um, they need to be cut away sometimes. They aren't, they aren't real. You know, they... And, it's, and it is sometimes that we need to know we're in darkness and we don't even realize we're in darkness. <laughs> and we think, oh, everything's fine. And then suddenly you feel like there's just a whole, something's missing, you know, even in a, in a good life, even in a life that where things are going pretty well. You can feel like there's something missing. And there's so much more, right? There's so much more that God has for us. And not knowing that, I think, is one of the saddest things um, when someone doesn't have a relationship with God. It's like, there's so much more <laughs> than what you think is good. You, and that's good. It's nothing, you know, those things are nice. But there's so much more. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move us to the last uh, one I want to talk about for today. And this moves us into the first week of Christmas because, you know, Christmas goes all the way really through Epiphany. Um, and this is uh, one of my favorite passages from Proverbs. We don't look at Proverbs very much. Um, Proverbs is great to study. It's, a hard, it's hard to study because it's all these sort of phrases and um, there's not a narrative to it, but it's a great book. <coughs> oh, I'm on page 124 if you have a book. Um, and it's Proverbs 3 and uh, she lists 3, 1 through 8 uh, as the entire reading, but this is just Proverbs 3, verse 5, which is very familiar. It's emblazoned on many a coffee mug. I have one. <laughs> I should have brought. Um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. And some tra translations say, do not rely on your own understanding. 
Um, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own, I'm going to say understanding, that's my preferred translation. Um, so Jill talks about this. She says, um, you know, we remember all these things. We remember, um, remember God's teaching. Hold fast to loyalty and faithfulness. Do not rely on your own insight. Follow these instructions according to Proverbs. Bolsters our trust in the Lord. Trust the Lord with all your heart. In contrast, question your own thinking and insight. One of the conundrums we face, though, is how to tell the difference. <laughs> So I wanted this to be our, our last devotion because it's going to be sort of the, the thing to think about as we go into the new year, right? Something for maybe a, a meditation for the new year. Often we want God's stamp of approval on our own judgments and plans, so much that we convince ourselves that they are synonymous. She writes, I appreciate that Anne Lamott quote, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. <laughs> yes. That's a clue right there. <laughs> That's a big, big clue. Like, God hates those people too. Really? I'm pretty sure he doesn't. <laughs> pretty sure that's just you. Hence the admonishment to trust the Lord with all our heart and do not rely on our own insight. So here's how, you know, well, then we're like, well, that's well and good. How do we do that? <laughs> you know? Jill will not leave us hanging. Because we need to check our insights against those of God. When we need to check our insights against those of God, we need only look to Jesus to see if one resembles the other. If the likeness between our thinking and that of the teaching of Jesus closely matches, then hold fast to it. If not... Be faithful enough to back up, regroup, and think again. That's a tough one for us. Yes. We've made up our minds, right? We've, whatever it is, whatever stance we have taken and we have dug in our heels, we have planted our flag, this is what we're doing, this is what I think, you know. We just did. It, right. it is right, yes, it is right. I am right, convinced that I am right. But if we do what Jill has asked us to do, if we say, well, you know, what do I know about Christ? What do, what do I know? Hmm, pretty sure Christ would not have anything to do with my plan. <laughs> and would not agree with me whatsoever on how I feel about X, Y, Z, right? But he would probably ask me to give that some more thought, back it up. Before you go running out the door you know or running off your mouth think again think again but she does allow that our culture does not support this sort of idea right our culture is not about, our culture is about i'm gonna say what i'm gonna say and i'm not gonna back down from it right right and oh gosh you know i could go on about social media but we've heard it a million times you know, the anonymity, the ability to just say whatever you want to say without any thought to how it impacts another person, or even if you believe it, you just say it. it sounds good, right? Yeah. You put something out in the world that you, you never even gave a thought to, and now it's out there. And someone may have been very hurt by it. So what she says about our culture it's not just the U.S., it's everywhere in the world. Changing our mind on an issue brings forth calls of hypocrisy or weakness or disloyalty. And someone will call us on that. Well, you just said, you know, or all your life you've said this, and now you're saying, what a hypocrite. <clears throat> I thought about it. I changed my mind. <clears throat> that is our part of our tradition. We call ourselves reformed and always reforming, always being reformed. You could, you could change out reformed to transformed, transformed and always being transformed, always <coughs> transforming. Yeah, you know what? I thought about that. I was wrong all those years. I was wrong. 
that's not easy to say. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to stand up and say, yeah, um, you can find, you know, maybe something I wrote about that or said about that or preached about that or I was wrong. I was just wrong. It takes a lot of trust, hence the proverb. <laughs> trust, it starts with the word trust. First, you have to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Yeah, I'm gonna have to eat some crow. It's not gonna taste good. I'm gonna be maybe embarrassed, yeah. Maybe I'm gonna be called a hypocrite or that I'm weak, that I'm just backing down. It's like, no, maybe I just changed my mind. She writes, this text reminds us, however, that our only unchanging loyalty is to the Lord. And that complete trust in and love of God provides the true north of our wisdom, judgment, and behavior. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. And she admits, like the rest of it, she said, I am inclined to capitulate to earthly powers, to look out for number one and relish when those I dislike get what I think should be coming to them. <laughs> we have our little judgments and we take delight when we think they have been meted out to someone. That's what they deserved. Really? Did anybody deserve that? I don't know. I don't know. Who are you to say what they deserved? So it's no wonder Proverbs tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and do not rely on your own understanding. When I hold up my conclusions and compare them to the person of Jesus Christ and the teaching of God, the contrast between the two is stark and easy to distinguish after all. Yeah. So we've got just a, we do actually have, look at that, we have a couple minutes left. <laughs> So she does have a couple questions at the end. Um, and I think, you know, I know, I know the answer to this, but if you have additional thoughts on it, it says, do you find it difficult to discern God's wisdom from your own? If, no one, if somebody does not have a problem with this, please sign up to preach because I would like for you to talk to the entire congregation. Um, but she does ask, to, how do you go about telling the difference between the two? And then follow up, often we are told to we are told to trust your gut. How does that cultural admonishment fit or not fit with the instructions from Proverbs? Does so anybody want to weigh in on either of those or just something else entirely related, though, however, <laughs> to this to this particular devotion? I think we take for granted that God is never turned turn back on us. Right. So because of that, there's not really much that I need to do to build a relationship with God in my mind because it's already a given relationship that I'm not gonna lose. Well, like when I'm with my wife, if I wanna charm her heart, I need to work on it. So, because it's not a given relationship, but God's relationship, because it's already been given to me, it might be, maybe it's an understatement, but I don't think I've been much better you yeah. just make decisions without thinking that mm -hmm. you can rely on a second opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Because no matter what, it's there. So I guess, right. it's, 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 I guess when I make decisions during the day, I just forget that those might be standing there just watching. Me. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, we, yeah, that's good. That's awesome. <laughs> if we have that given understanding, um, yeah, if we can hold on to that, I think that does help guide us, and, and in some ways, we it's kind of when we talk about praying without ceasing, at some point you, you learn to make decisions also without questioning them so much because you, you've absorbed and, and starting to embody, well, this is what I know about Christ. This is this given relationship. I'm in it already. Here's, here's what I do. Here's how I base my decisions. Um, that's that's a, a wonderful gift to, to have. And sometimes we forget, we, we do forget sometimes that God is there always, constantly. We also sometimes forget that God is with that person we don't like. <laughs> God is also with the criminal who's done something absolutely despicable and still standing with that person as well. And we, we don't want to admit that. I was like, well, yeah, God's with me, but not with that person. <laughs> like, hmm. Really? 
really? Did God just pick and choose you because you're so special? You left the dog outside. Sorry. Yeah. In the rain. In the rain. And it was raining. Yeah, right. Poor dog. Yeah. But it is good if we can get to the point where we have that constant understanding. I mean, that is that is part of what we are working towards. Yeah. Other comments? I have a story. A story, yes. In days of old. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> um, it was a big deal to put a tightrope across Niagara Falls. Oh, yeah. And walk across it in the Walinda family. Yes. And he would da -da 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 -da, had a wheelbarrow mm. with a 150-pound bag of sand in it. Wow. He said, do you think I could take a purse. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get in. <laughs> the person, That's trust. The person who asked that question That's got to get trust. in. That's <laughs> Yeah. To go across. How do, you, how do you be the one to get in the wheelbarrow? Yeah, that's a great analogy. Actually, I might have to borrow that, Jane. Anybody get in? I think somebody finally did. That's a great... Well, I, mean, I mean, you can Google Walendas. <laughs> yeah. I am not making that up. It's not a Jainism. No, <laughs> Jane, that's a, that's a great sermon illustration right there. I'm, it's going to show up one day. Um, yeah, trust in the Lord. How, how far are we going to trust? You, you saw what this Walinda well, could, you know, one of the family could do. He came back and forth. He risked his own life. He didn't fall in. How much are you going to trust that you're not going to fall in if you go with him? There was a sermon there, Jane. <laughs> there was a sermon you go, there. Girl. <laughs> yeah, if we if we go with Christ, if we get in that wheelbarrow, and Jesus is pushing us across. Now, are we willing? Are we willing? We're like, okay, it's gonna be all right. I'm gonna trust. Yeah, are we gonna go wherever Christ goes, whatever He calls us to do? Are we gonna go? Or is our is our little worldly mindset gonna go? Mm, mm. I don't think that's a good plan for me, and I need to check my insurance policy and perhaps do a few other things before I consider this, but maybe, maybe I would do it. I think Jesus was thinking that when Jesus asked him to get out of the boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happens if I get out of this boat? Seems like something's going to change dramatically if I get out of this boat, right? Great, great line. If you want, you know, this book, if you want to walk on the water, you got to get out of the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got to get out of the boat. Can't just stand there looking at the water going. Yeah, looks pretty liquidy to me. <laughs> Sometimes you got to say, "Okay." He asked me to do it. Why would he ask me to do that? Has he ever asked me to do anything that would knowingly hurt me? No. No. Then why wouldn't I try at least? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. I'm going to leave you just with that proverb. Oh, and there's probably an acolyte waiting for me. So, thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of this study. And, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna let Carl come up and talk about what he's going to be teaching. And then, Carl, if you can turn off the video when yeah, you're sure. done, that would be perfect. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so uh, January 9th, we'll start an eight-week uh, cell lesson on the discipline of building Christian community. Um, and it will be provocative. It will be intended to be engaging. Uh, I wanna ask us to look hard at ourselves. I wanna look at examples throughout the, the, the text, the Bible, uh, to see what we are called to do. And I want us to leave that study changed. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna give us some practical things to discuss and ways to act. Uh, the task for y'all is to everybody bring somebody. So let's pack the house uh, and start the community right here. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm still writing it, so I'm still making stuff up. Um, and uh, uh, I expect lots of good feedback and, uh, and attendance. So any questions? Start looking January the night. Huh? Looking forward. All right. Thank y'all. Thank you.